<laughs> Robin. <laughs> Selfie here. I think Paul just kind of just walked in in the middle. Did anyone like help you out? They they brought Paul in while we're doing a live. And read. He's just standing there awkward. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you, Paul Anka. A pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, let's get a good picture. Get over here, Jimmy. <laughs> what are let's you guys doing? Let's get a big doing? photo op. <laughs> nice. I love it. I can't stop reading the book. Yeah, the book My Way is going to be a big hit for Paul Anka. There's some stuff in there. It's a lot of stuff. I wish I had more time with it. Cause I, have, I haven't finished it, and you started... Like you've heard a million stories about old Vegas and Vegas in the 50s and the 60s, but for some reason, the way you described it is the best description I've heard of Vegas back in those glory days. Like, it really made me crave going to Vegas back in the 60s. Well, it was a place to be craved. I mean, it was the real deal when I was out there. I mean, the way I laid it out very carefully was, uh, you know, a lot of it was hearsay. A lot of people were on the periphery trying to capture it. But when you're there and you're living it, you're in the steam room with Sinatra and Davis and Dean Martin, and you're all running around nude. <laughs> a lot of stuff happens. <laughs> Did you ever see Milton Brawl nude? Oh, good. And, and his third leg? Yes. <laughs> Is that true? All true. All true. And there's enough for all of us in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, all true. Well, Frank was pretty good, too. Really? Oh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Of the Rat Pack, we, we, did Sinatra have the biggest hog out of Are the whole Are we on pack? the air? Yes. Yeah. Oh, gee. This I, is, this I didn't mean anything August. I said. <laughs> uh, Are you kidding me? This uh, is, yeah, this Francis was very well endowed. Yeah. Wow. Guy Marks. Yeah. Uh, Milton Burrow was the guy. Yeah. That was it. You know? I mean, I didn't get down and measure it, but I had good it. perception. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching, uh, I went on just, you know, just you know how you get into a YouTube loop and you start watching live videos. And I was just watching Sammy Davis yeah. from, uh, I, I, he was overseas. It was after Candyman went number one. Right. And I think he, I mean, Everyone knew Sammy, but people forget how like he was. He was a great singer. Like, oh, he was the, he was incredible. I mean, he, you know, he wanted to be Frank, but the guy's a singer was sensational. Frank adored him. Uh, they had a little outing there somewhere in the middle because of something. But when you get down to it, pound for pound, he was the greatest entertainer for me. I mean, I'd sit and watch this guy at the Sands, and we knew each other very, very well. Mm. Nobody liked him. Nobody liked this guy, and I just I learned a lot from him. Uh, he lived his life, you know, he really lived it to the fullest in a time where we weren't really a media-driven society. And the stuff that he got into and, and put his courage of his convictions behind it, you gotta, you got to really hand it to him because he went through a lot of adversity and had a tough, tough life, but it's so talented. No, and I don't see anybody today like him. A lot of guys copy him, but there's nobody like Sammy Davis mm. you know, or Frank Sinatra. And didn't Sinatra, like, yeah. I don't know much about Sinatra compared to other artists, but he really, like, he wouldn't work if they wouldn't treat Sammy right. Like, he, he really loved Sammy Davis. He loved Dean Martin. He loved Sammy. He loved his friends. Put his foot down. Talk about civil rights and all that garbage that went on back then. Frank literally turned all that around. When they wouldn't let any blacks into the hotels, it was Frank and all of us that just said, we're not here if they're not here. So he was very, very supportive of Sammy from day one. And that's the kind of guy he was. You know, in a time where, you know, you guys are, you know, you're not my age, obviously, but pop music and that whole genre of stuff, show business was in its infancy stage back then. You know, when you had Vegas and you had that crowd, that was it. You know, mm -hmm. Bobby Darren and I would look at those guys and go, we want to be like them. Right. We didn't see Hendrix coming. You didn't see the Beatles coming. You didn't see Hard Rock coming. And thus, it was all that Vegas vibe. The mob guys who ran it, who were great, they were gentlemen, shook your hand, the safest place to be. Wow. When you look at Vegas today with what's going on, you can get shot crossing the strip. Yeah. And all that stuff that goes on in these clubs after and, you know, these so so called celebrities who yeah. have a rough night and then they wind up in a hospital and say it's heat exhaustion. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole new town out there. Yeah. So, yeah, back then. I loved it, and uh, we loved working for those guys. They were really, really cool to work. They for. took care of you. Absolutely. Yeah. And you minded your business, and you knew the rules, and they really took care of you. These guys were just gentlemen all the way through. I mean, I, I've never had a bad rap, ever. Mm -hmm. was I mean, there a, oh, musically, uh, was Sinatra, you know, he make, he took your, your song, which my way, mm -hmm. and made it into a huge hit. Mm -hmm. uh, did you? Can you explain to me musically... What Sinatra had that made him so special? Well, it's you know I I look at it as genetics. Uh -huh. He genetically had that voice and that stuff, 
And then he was a guy that rehearsed all the time. Uh -huh. He was a guy that just had that it. Right. And the it was, you know, everybody else after him got arrested for loitering in front of a band. Because he was the guy, you know. I mean, right. nobody could do it like he did because of his phrasing, his whole musical sense. And then when you compound it with what he was about, you had all of this perception working for you that when he went on stage and with his work ethic, he just had that thing. He knew what to do with a song and right. never ever went into an area that he didn't understand to try and sing something. Now, with that said, is it true you gave away My Way for yeah. free? Mm -hmm. For free. Is, what's the story behind that? Because I'm, I was saying earlier, as a songwriter, you yeah. had to know you had something. You just yes. had to know you were in the zone. Like this is absolutely going to be a hit. Well, prefacing that, you know, for years, you know, Mr. Sinatra used to tease me about writing for him. Now I'm a kid. Mm. Right. You know, you, you never know in life. Shit happens. All of a sudden, you're in. Now you got this kid working out there in Vegas, youngest ever. How old were you? Youngest at the Copa. I started at 18. 18. Wow. And then I evolved into my 20s. But the point is. You know, he always, he never liked pop music. He loved the good stuff, and so he should have. And he'd always say, you're going to write me something. I never, I didn't have the balls to give him Lonely Boy or Puppy Love. He would have thrown me out of a window. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so as the years, as the years evolved, right, uh, Don Costa, who I introduced him to, was my, uh, my genius and my producer. I introduced him to uh, Mr. Sinatra. And, um, I was in Miami working the Fountain Blue when it was the thing to do back then. Yeah. And he called up and said, kid, we're going to dinner. So whenever he called and said, go to dinner, you went to dinner <laughs> and bring your passport because you never know where you yeah. wind up the next day. you know. <laughs> so I went to dinner and he told me that night, along with everyone at dinner, that he was retiring. He was really? Out. He'd had it. Wow. And, and what that, year was this? This was uh, 67, 68, wow. somewhere in there. So I was moved by that. I went back to New York. Uh, where I was living here and I sat down at the piano at one o'clock in the morning and I said this is my last shot you know I've got to write something and I metaphorically <clears throat> approached it with him retiring and now the end is near oh wow so I the final curtain and started to write itself so everything in there where I normally wouldn't use words like I ate it up and spit it out it was all Sinatra all ah. Sinatra finished it at five in the morning called him in Vegas uh Took a demo out, gave it to him with uh, Costa. Two months later, he called me from a studio. He said, kid, listen to this. And he put the phone up to the speaker. I'm in New York in my apartment. He played me my way for the first time. Wow. He started crying. Wow. Because I knew I had something. Just knew it. Because wow. nobody could sell a song. He could sure. sing the phone book, you know. The man was amazing. He was just uh, an incredible artist. How old were you? I was in my late 20s. Late 20s. To write I was in my, my late way. 20s to write it. RCA Victor, the label I was at, were a little pissed because I didn't record it. I said, look, I'm old enough to write it, but I'm too young to record it. No kidding. Wow. It's all about Sinatra. When and did he get your version out there? Oh, years later. Yeah. Years later. Yeah. And Elvis's version, I like. I, I actually have the, the, you may want to smash me for this, but I prefer Elvis's version. Like, I love what Elvis covers songs. And, and yeah. that, I loved it. There's a very great video of Elvis at the end where he's going, we're going to do a number now, and uh, I don't know the lyrics to it. And, and he goes, and then, then the band guy had to go, it's my way. And he goes, uh, my way. Like, he was just so high. The guy had to tell him it was my way. And he's holding the fucking lyrics to it. No, poor Elvis. You know, I used to sit with him in Vegas at the end. Great artist, too. Great voice. Yeah. Great interpreter songs. And uh, we used to sit together, you know, near the end. And he used to sit at Caesars backstage because he worked the Hilton and go, Polly, I'm going to do that song, Polly. I really love that my way. And I'd say, Elvis, it's not your kind of song, man. You don't want to do that. He said, no, man. It means a lot to me. I'm going to do that song. So anyway, <laughs> he does it. And he called me and he told me about it. And I really got the kind of the... The intent and the emotion of it, because he knew what he was going through. It, it was the same kind of vibe I got from um, uh, Sex Pistols, Sid Vicious. Yeah. You know, I kind of went, what? When I first heard it, when Scorsese right. called and used it for the movie. But then I oh, understood right. it meant a lot to him. I right. forgot that they did I it forgot until he, and, and they got a lot of shit from their fans when they, when they yeah. covered but, that song. But their version is great, too. Yeah. Yeah, real cool. So what I'm saying is it meant something to Elvis. I loved his version, absolutely agree, only because I knew the backstory and the lead-up where I tried to talk him out of it. Right, right. How he really wanted to do it, because it meant so much to him. Anyone else do My Way that, that we don't talk about? Yeah, yeah, are there any My Way out there that you're like, oh, let's do that guy. <laughs> yeah, some of those. <laughs> yeah, I ate it up and swallowed it. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. <laughs> um, there's some great versions, actually. My, one of my favorite is Brooke Benton. 
Brooke Benton. Nina I don't Simone know. and Brooke Benton. Okay. I don't know Two that one. Very, and the Gypsy Kings. I'll check it yeah, out. You check it out. Please. I'll definitely check it out. Do you like? Uh, do you enjoy when people cover your music and, and like you don't know about it until you hear it on the radio, or, or is, is there something where you kind of want to be told beforehand, or are you just happy to hear it? Well, the <clears throat> the technicality of it and the infrastructure of our industry is before they do it, they need a license. Oh, they do. So they'll send me a piece of paper saying so and so is going to record it. And you go yay or nay. I mean, I've never said nay. Right. And you know in front what's happening. And you love it. You know, yeah. your songs are like your children. You know, you can't pick your favorite. You put a lot into it. And when some an artist comes along with a different interpretation, like Tom Jones. Yeah. You know, I could never have done She's a Lady. And Tom's got a great voice, a great artist. And when I wrote it for him, when they somebody like that comes along and you're right. writing for them, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I started as a writer. It all starts with the song, like Shakespeare plays the thing. Right. Yeah. Without that song, you're nowhere. You got to get back to the music. I mean, even today, I mean, you really got to get back to Man, the music. Man, you wrote a lot of hits. You wrote a lot of hits. And, and also, speaking oh of Shakespeare, didn't, yeah. didn't you want to take his lyrics when you were younger and make songs out of them? Which I think is pretty ambitious for a really young guy to read Shakespeare and go, I want to make songs out of this. Well, I kind of played around with it just to get structure and see what was in it. It was obviously a lot more complicated and sophisticated in kind of the quatrains and the way he rhymed things. But it was kind of a test for me to play with it. Because I wanted to be a writer. I was working a local newspaper as a cub reporter and uh, got thrown in a shorthand because I hated it. And I took music. And it all started from there. You know, and then I saw this girl who I, I had a crush on, this Diana, who was a few years older. And I started writing. You know, in a time there was no American Idol. You know, when I grew up, mm -hmm. my link to the world was a radio. I'd go sit in the rug in my mother's living room and just listen to the radio. We had nothing to relate to. Yeah. And that started to turn me on. I knew I had to get to New York. And I knew I loved to write, but it wasn't happening in Canada. So I entered a, a contest for IJ Food Stores. I saw an ad in the paper that said, collect uh, Campbell Soup wrappers and you'll win a trip to New York. So I, I, went to, I went to IG and I got a job and I was packing groceries and I was writing down all the women that bought the Campbell Soup. So I win the contest from my district. I'm on a train with 40 guys. And we, they brought us down from Canada. I'm staying at the Sloan House here, up on the, what, 38th floor. And I'm looking at New York. I never saw a high rise in my life. <laughs> I'm from Canada, 200,000 people. And I knew that this was it. I knew I had to get down here and make it happen. So it all started from that whole writing experience and mm. then evolving into singing, uh, breaking in a dressing room when Chuck Berry and Fats Domino were in town <laughs> and uh, running up to Chuck Berry and singing my song. He says, it's the worst song I ever heard. Go back to school. <laughs> 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 really? <laughs> It's in his book. And then, uh, but Fats Domino was cool. He kind of he was a nice guy. And uh, anyway, fade in, fade out. Was a year later, I make Diana, and I'm on tour with guess who? Fats Domino and Chuck Berry. Wow! <laughs> and did he remember hey, you, you before? Uh, I, th I think he did, but didn't want to admit it. Yeah. <laughs> and how old you were? About eighteen. Uh, sixteen. S you were sixteen. Oh, I left. I wrote it at fifty. I left at sixteen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Was you there an arc to your? To your writing, did it just kind of come out of the gates really explosive, or did you mature as? Did you, for you personally, did you enjoy it at a certain point more than another? Yeah, it evolves like anything. Yeah, you know? I mean, you start as a young teenager and you're writing about stuff that teenagers think about and what they do, right? You know, you have to realize. That all of us that started in the business, any of us, I mean, even even you guys and what you do, you know, we, we're not born sophisticated. You right. get this stroke of luck, you're doing something you like to do, and then you're scratching your way along that highway of life, trying to cope with success and find out who the hell you are. Right. So as you evolve under that premise, as you get older and learn your craft... Your songs get better. You know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're sitting on the beaches of Normandy with Daryl Zanuck, you know, at, what, 21 years old, and you got John Wayne and Robert Mitchum and all these guys <laughs> that you went to a movie to watch, and you're right. trying to remain cool, and you're going, shit, <laughs> look yeah. at this, right? And you're there with thousands of troops, and then you get inspired, and then you write The Longest Day, right? Wow. Now you're the youngest kid that's nominated for an Academy Award at 21. So you evolve. You say, well, I can do that. I'm going to do the Tonight Show theme. And then you do the Tonight Show theme. And wow. Then Buddy Holly. So, yes, you, you start to learn your craft if you, if you keep yourself straight, keep the integrity of what you're doing, and continually improve, improve and mature until right. you get to 27, 28, and you're right my way. Was it a dedication to the work that, that kept you straight? Like when This is all mind-blowing stuff, and mm. there's got to be women, and there's got to be booze, and there's got to be oh, tons absolutely. of stuff. Oh, please, yes. what, what was it that kept you straight? 
kept you well, grounded? Work was ethic. it the work? Yeah. Work ethic, absolutely. Just the work. I came my my background, my education, my family. It was about work ethic. I worked right. as a kid at twelve, thirteen, fourteen. You know, I had my own money, three bucks, but it was yeah. a lot for me. So it was work ethic. You know, I look at these kids today, and I really feel for them because they're not handling it for a lot of reasons. Yeah. But you know, back then. You hit, you have a number one record, you, you're making two, three hundred bucks a week, a lot of money back then. Yeah. But you're realizing that your life has changed and you got a fortunate vibe going for you. You know, people are kissing your ass all day and you're trying not to be an asshole. Yeah. Because of that. You know, <laughs> yes. you're going, wait a second. But you realize that if you lose that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the old saying, uh, you know, a, a man is defined by the occupation. And a woman is defined by the man she marries. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you don't got that occupation going for you, something that's working for you, you're kind of like, you're lost. It's yeah. over. Yeah. And I didn't want to lose that. I knew that if I kept producing and if I kept working at it, uh, that I could get some longevity out of it. I just never crossed the line to where it got me in trouble. You can remember, right. I was around that stuff. I yeah. saw Frankie Lyman shooting up. Wow. And, you know, you, you make these decisions, no and yes. Yeah. And then the Rat Pack and those guys who were great to be around. Yeah. And a lot of fun, but a lot of drinking and a lot of this, a lot of excess. You do a little of it, mm -hmm. enough that you can get up and go to work the next day and right. keep what you're about. Right. But good question, because there's many times where you go, I could almost have blown. You could it. easily yeah. said yes. Yeah. Well, you right. said something interesting too in, in the book. You you talk about people and you said kids today in the fame and you said that um, I wrote the quote down. Fame has become an end in itself, unattached to any achievement. Like people just now want to go. I want to be famous, not I want to be a songwriter exactly. or a singer, which will make you famous. They just want the fame without That's the, the point. When I meet with kids today, they want to do, want to do. It's uh, I just want to be famous. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I don't know. I just want to be famous. I want to make money. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then you got the others that come up. They said, I'm a musician. I'm writing songs. I want to perform. And and they hand me a computer. I said, what do you mean? They said, you're not a musician. <laughs> it's a computer. <laughs> well, you know, and they sit and they write on these computers. Right. Now, I think times change and I get it. But what we've lost here in all the technology in some cases is you're losing that heart and soul and blood of what real music and art yeah. was years ago. And when you start losing that, yeah. and it's all about this and this, which works in certain sectors of life, yeah. when you lose it in, in music, uh, thus Adele, who steps forward out of nowhere, because the consumer's not stupid. You mm. know, They know what they want, they know what they don't want to hear. So when they hear something that's got some substance to it, they go to it, and they'll go to good music. We, you know, I'm sure you've addressed it before, but the very famous tape of you yelling about the guys having Those shirts. shirts yeah. We love that. We, we had so but, much fun with that, Paul, i got to tell you. Oh, you and Howard Stern. Howard, we, Howard, we, we had a Howard. blast. We loved it. Like, listen, I get a lot of fan mail on it. I don't get it. I mean, I'm one of, what, 8,000? The one I love is, the, uh, is Tommy Lasorda and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the actor that died, Orson Welles. Have you heard those? Oh two? God, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, we we'd hired this guy. It was nineteen, I think it was nineteen eighty one. And I'm a perfectionist, man. Yeah. You know, I go on that stage every night like it's the first time because you know I know if you just drop it a couple of times, you're gone. Yep. It's all about reputation. And I'm a stickler about the music and right down to what they're wearing because I respect my audience. <laughs> and this guy we had hired had been with us one month. He wasn't that good, obviously. He had taken this meeting that I had telling the guys what was wrong with the show. It's like, what's the yeah. analogy? Uh, at the end of a bad ball game, right? Mm, sure. You get them in the locker room. Sure. Yeah. And, I, and I'm a straight cat. I mean, I just let them know right away what it is. <laughs> so when I heard about it, it came slapping back. I said, it was that mother. I know exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we fired him. <laughs> but you listen to that. It, it's obvious that, you know what? The fucking guys were sloppy. They and good for you to, to smash them. The guys <laughs> get shirts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the payoff for me was I got a call from uh, uh, Koppelman. He was a writer uh, on a movie with Pacino. It was one of the Ocean's 11 or 12 or 13. And the, he needed to get motivated Al did, <laughs> and they wrote this scene from Shirts, and they they fitted it to Al, and then they had Al listen, Pacino, to Shirts, <laughs> to get him to where he needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy called me and says, can we do that? I said, shit, go ahead. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> How did you balance... Uh you're a great songwriter, but you also were a really great performer. Mm. How is was that a difficult thing of like what stuff am I going to give to other people and what am I going to? How am I going to shine on my own? Yeah, I, good question because you know it started. I wasn't sure when the Beatles hit what the future was for a lot of right. us. Right? Were you guys scared? 
uh, when they first hit, like well, I oh, wasn't boy. really scared because my agent Norman Weiss, because I, you know, back then there's no, uh, we're not media, okay. I'd right. come back and from France and say I had this croissant, and some people thought it was like a car, and then I said you went to it, sat on a B day, and they thought it was a movie. <laughs> Nobody knew what anything was, and right. I'd come back after meeting the Beatles and uh, tell people about them, and they were say what? And I told my uh, guy Normie Weiss, who went over and brought them over in '64. But the point was, yeah, things got a little shaky because we got blown off the radio. What kept me anchored was I'd had the Tonight Show theme, The Longest Day, and then I packed up and I went to Italy. And I started selling like millions of records in Italian. And, and I had a career over there and went to Germany, did the same thing. So I didn't have to be here all the time. So when it got a little shaky, I realized that my writing was the most important. Right. And then as I stayed in Vegas and the gravitas remained from Vegas, watching those guys work, I started to grow into myself as a performer. It didn't happen right away. Right. You know, I held my own, but it didn't happen right away. So this is like late 20s, early 30s? Yeah, pr yeah. probably my mid-20s. Mid-20s. Yeah, going into my 30s. And at some point, it just clicked that I knew what I was doing on stage and I'd learned enough. Yeah. But I always felt that the writing was the most important, but I never wanted to keep it always for myself because I felt insecure about, wait a minute, how can I go and have a record out every three months and why should Paul Anka be on the radio f mm. every year for the rest of my life? So it was Tom Jones, it was giving stuff away wow. because it kept that other side of my life yeah. out there for people and it's what I enjoyed doing because I started as a writer. As a writer, I yeah. I started singing my stuff because nobody wanted to sing it. Who oh. could have <laughs> sing, I'm so young and you're so old? I mean, right. the, the first <laughs> line alone will turn you I'd off, love right? to sing that to my Coworkers. <laughs> how, how close were you to growing your hair out, though, and following the following the trend? Um, well, Bobby did it. You know, Darren, yeah, yeah. he That's right. left, and we talked about it. And I felt, I said, you know, Bobby, look, you're a great artist, and he could probably do anything. Uh, but it was just a jolt to everyone. I I didn't really feel motivated because I was satisfied. Uh, with the vibe that I was in, the niche that was really still working for me. Right. And I never felt that I wanted to compromise myself just for the sake of what was happening. Because when you compromise, I mean, even with the book, you compromise because you want people to like you. You never have any kind of progress. Mm. So I never believed in it. In that yeah, and you guys were all about the same age, too. The yeah. Beatles. And yeah, Bobby was a little older. Yeah. Uh, the Beatles and the Stones and those guys were around my age. You know, a couple of them are a couple of years. Yeah, give or older. take a few, yeah, exactly. but yeah. within range. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Can, range, can you yeah. talk about too? We I, again, I was flipping through the book. At every page, there was something interesting. I really, I'm not being it's polite. True. It really was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I landed on when you were talking about meeting with Sinatra for one of the last times you saw him, which was a dinner you guys had together. Yeah. And uh, could you talk about that? Because it was really interesting. One of his regrets. Well, you know, I always lo <coughs> loved being in his company. He was um, a very warm human being, and he loved his friends, and he was always a lot of fun. <coughs> and near the end, obviously, it wasn't all working, and um, we were all touched by that. And I had dinner with he and his wife, Barbara, at the uh, MGM where he was working. And somewhere during the course of the, the meal, he said, you know, I I've really got one big regret and he said, I always wanted to uh, do the Marlon Brando part in The Godfather. He said, I called everybody. I tried to go in an audition. That should have been me doing that. Nobody felt that part like me. And, you know, I couldn't get anybody to listen to me. But he wanted to play The Godfather. Wow. wow. That's such an <laughs> odd thing to look back on. Yeah. yeah. I guess everybody ha If you're going to regret something, not playing The Godfather that's is pretty good. That's yeah. not a bad one to have. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, exactly. You know, I regret that I didn't, I didn't bang that five in Connecticut. <laughs> that's, like, that's like a real... Right. And, and, uh, and Annette Funicello uh, passed away. And you, yeah. you, you were close. Yeah, um, yeah. Sad, sad, sad day. Yeah, we were close. Um, she was part of our young teenage scene back then you know she came out on tour she was huge for disney america loved her uh you know she was the one you know she was just that girl next door yeah and they put her on tour with us and you know obviously there's me and frankie avalon and fabian and you know we're teenagers <laughs> yeah it's not about the money it's the women yeah and uh, everybody loved her and anyway um i started writing for her she, she was very shy about uh singing even though she could but she really had somewhat of a mm, i'm not sure and i kind of helped her through all of that and wrote an album for her but she was a very professional dedicated 
family woman. You know, her mother would travel with her. Uh, everything that she did was she was study and and want to do good. And I had some great great times with her. I mean, she was. Uh, we we talked about marriage. Obviously, I couldn't do it. She didn't want to do it. Uh, well, she wanted to do it, but knew that it wasn't going to work because Disney and everybody around her were just all over us. That it was a puppy love. Thus, I wrote puppy love, you know, for uh, her and I, because they kept pounding it into our heads. But it was a great loss. Um, you know, she was very courageous, and when she um, found out about MS, very quickly, post of that. Uh, she stepped forward and really shared it with a lot of people to give them some kind of sense of what it was about, to give them some hope, to give them some education, yeah. if you will, on it. But loved Annette, loved her family, just good people. Uh, my agent at the time, Jack Gillardi, another great guy, uh, he married her. Had some wonderful children, very successful. And it's a great loss. You know, you're never ready for it, even though you hate to see people suffer. When that door really closes on anyone... You hate to see it because something inside you closes. You know, I, I, I just feel that God has now got a lot of people bowling in my bowling alley. <laughs> you know, they're yeah. just going down. Mm. So, and she'll be missed. She, she was a very special girl. You had all girls yourself? I had five girls. Five girls. Yep, wow. I had a Catholic woman with bad rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then I got a son recently. <laughs> oh, recently? Yeah, well, seven years ago. Wow. wow. And he's something else. Changed my life and uh, takes the focus off of you and you put it into a beautiful little human being. Children are where it's at today, I got to tell you. Yeah. I feel very blessed to have that little boy in my life. Is there anything you regret? Because Sinatra talked about that. Is there anything you look back on? And I'm sure we all have them, but is there anything you look back on that's kind of been a, a thorn for you that you're like, I wish I would have done that a little better? Yeah, I think we all have regrets. You know, yeah. uh, you feel funny talking about it when you've been given so much. Sure. You know, so that's, it, when, that, when that balance is so to the right, to sit down and start <clears throat> regretting stuff in abundance, to me, it's just kind of ungrateful. You know, yeah, there's things that you've done. There's uh, business moves that you've made you wish you hadn't made. But, you know, shit happens in life to all of us. And you, and you can never really see what's coming. You know, my whole approach to that at a young age was try and see problems coming before they get there. And you alleviate all of that. You know, big regrets for me were losing my mother. You know, I could do nothing about it. She was my ally. Uh, she'd give me money. She worked at Sears Roebuck for, so I could get my music. You know, back then, they didn't know about all this American Idol stuff. So she was the one that stuck by me. And, you know, at 18, uh, she died in her mid-30s. And, you know, I couldn't quite grasp all of that. That was tough on me. And then later on, some some business things that went down and... But nothing that I to to really talk about. Right. You know, I can say they're out there and there is stuff there, but is it embedded in me? No, nah, you know, when you, when you got it going and and, you, and you're still going and you're doing it, you kind of look back. The good thing I look back on is, you know, we learned to fail back then. You can't fail today. Yeah. You, you guys do a stretch here and fail for three months, you got trouble. Mm. You know, in, in my business. Back then, I could fail, and I could go on stage and do my thing, and you learn from that. Today, you can't. You know, today, you can't. That's why I feel fortunate coming up when I did, because I really learned my craft. You know, you go in a studio and, with a band, and that's the record you got. You know, today, you sit around with, you know, 112 tracks and equipment. Right. It takes three years, and you want to sound like this guy, press this button. You know, it's all a whole whole different record. So it's, not, it's, so it's not just romantic. Like whenever I look at all that era, I get so jealous. I'm like, that seems like a great time to have been in show business you see guys going on the tonight show you see guys going to vegas oh. it it really was that good wasn't it was it? yeah on. it was but you had work there was stuff right to get there was it as crucial uh was it uh as severe as it is today hmm. no it was easier yeah you know smaller group of people there was a everybody had a camaraderie about them everybody yeah. had protectionism about each other and it was cool with those guys, and they were loose, and and it was real stuff. Yeah. You know, it wasn't technology stuff. I'm not against technology at all, but yeah. I just think it has its plus and its minuses. But back then, you had to be that good, you had to be that funny, yeah. you had to be on because you were alive. Right. And pe right. people kept secrets back then. It was like you could have these wild Rat Pack nights and all this stuff. Yeah, we did. 
But it's like, you know, you look at it now, out. it's TMZ. It's a matter of, let's see, you can snap a cell phone, a, a photo of somebody doing something wrong and then put it out there. And back then, th- these guys just didn't have that. It was like you guys would hang out and do what you did. It wasn't and, a well, media-driven society. We'd get in that steam room. I mean, forget about it. It was <laughs> I mean, uh, who's coming through the door now? And how many? And it, and it's fun. You know, it was guy fun. There was yeah. nothing wrong with it. Right. And everybody gets all wrapped up with a mob and what were they like. They were great guys. You know, they were... <laughs> Gentlemen, they spoke softly. If you didn't get out of line, nobody bothered you. We shared shared women. We shared laughs. laughs. It was just a great time. No, yeah, it didn't great. get out there. Thus, we continued to do it. Right. Unfortunately, today, they're watching all of us in many ways. Yeah. And you got to regulate your life and adjust mm. it. Because people are getting destroyed today. Their lives are getting destroyed. Their yeah. occupational vibe is getting destroyed. Because they don't know how to deal with... That kind of criticism. And there's, some of them are too young to know how to compute it. You know, so you're destroying more people and the chance for them to grow and emerge than right. yesterday when you went through all that stuff and it was good human stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you went on with your lives. You yeah. Know? Everybody wasn't so critical. Today, everybody's got an opinion. I know. I mean, opinions, uh, they're like assholes. Everybody has one. <laughs> I mean, everyone has an opinion about something. You, you watch these shows with these judges, you know, and they have to fill the time. <laughs> Half of them don't know about music, right? Yeah. And right. they're and they're, they're feeding these kids, like, you're a superstar. You're a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> the kid needs Vaseline up their butt. They're so nervous. They give me a superstar. <laughs> Do you, does, does the technology bother you and just audio, just listening to music, the compression of digital music, does that bug no. you at all? Or you think it's just no, I'm a today, purely... I'm a today guy. I appreciate everything from yesterday. I really get the technology and I use it mm-hmm. to its best benefit. Right. Okay, and it's worked for me in a lot of things. My new CD. You know, i got Frank Sinatra on there. Yeah. I've got um, uh, Michael Jackson on there. Wow. I mean, i got guys on there because of the technology. It's called right. duets, by yeah, the way. Yeah, the duets. And we got Willie Nelson and uh, Dolly Parton and Michael Buble. And, you know, a lot of it, because of the technology, we're able to have all those people there. Right. You know, like, uh, if I speak to Buble, he's in his studio in Vancouver, and I'm in L.A., right. and we're making the record. Wow. Wow. So the technology, when it works, is great. But right. it doesn't bother me when I know it's been used right. Right. And I know a lot of people are going back to vinyl and i love that sound right and it's honest shit i mean that stuff yeah. is you go in a studio you write the notes and you get three hours to get it and people work hard and it's honest and it's real yeah technology is a whole other application right yeah, you don't like when it makes young. up for i'm sorry you don't like when it makes up for a lack of talent or a lack of work you like when it's just it adds it makes things more exactly convenient. because we're we talking about auto tuning yeah 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 <laughs> well you know a lot of these singers out there today and they'll go nameless because I don't, I don't rap my fellow artists you know the, they can't really sing you know so and that helps them and gets them where they're at but you gotta live by that so you go and lip sync in concert and that in itself is a whole other right mm-hmm. it drives me nuts watching lip sync I watched yeah. I watched McCartney when he did the Super Bowl he didn't lip sync I know. He didn't lip sync when he sang at the Super Bowl. He yeah. sang. Yeah, right. He's been fucking insane. nuts. Yeah. He's dumb. He's running around lip syncing. I, I love when yeah. the record skips. Oh, it's just so great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gets, that happened to me on American Bands then. Really? really? had no choice. There's no bands. You, you go right. on and do your record, right? Right. So I'm doing Diana. And the guy's playing a record. You know, sometimes you get a bad record. And I'm singing away. I'm scared to death. I'm 17. I love you with my heart. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Oh, no. Uh-oh. What did you do? <laughs> what, what could I do? I'm just looking around. Uh-oh. Oh, 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 oh. Hey. Did they fix it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it went from that to the end of the record. Oh, please. <laughs> wow. Did that happen? What was the girl on the Saturday Night Live, the sister of um. Jessica... Oh God! Sister, remember not Jessica they, Simpson. Her, her sister. sister. Oh, Simpson. oh, oh yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, of course. Oh man, that, that happened brutal. her at uh, a football game, I think. Right? Yes, it was that was on SNL. Oh, it was. Oh, absolutely, was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was humiliating. For and they're, her. they're telling us Paul has other press. That's too bad. I have just this thing. It's okay. Another great part in your book too, where you talk about Dean Martin and seeing him at the end, and it's just so sad how this 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 you know it seems like he broke down after his son. Well, the son. I, look, a loss of a child, man, and you know, you don't even want to go there. And he was a cool guy. I mean, this guy 
forget all the drinking and everything. This was a lot of his apple juice. This guy would, you know, after the show, he'd go sit in the little tent off stage and eat a bowl of spaghetti and watch a Western, go to bed or to get up and golf. So he, he was a real cool, relaxed guy. But after the sun, and then when Frank wanted them all to go out on that tour, he, he, he didn't want to keep up that late night stuff anymore and he was just hurting inside and i i would go over and see him at this little restaurant on canon called uh, la familia they always sit in the back and i'd go with a buddy of mine who you know we knew him and he'd be sitting right in the back with his you know the pasta and the booze and his teeth were out and they're right there on the table sometimes in the glass and he'd say how you doing dean and he said i'm just waiting to die pally wow. just waiting to die Jeez. Jeez. yeah he just he just couldn't recover. Just wow. waiting to die, Pally. Oh, <laughs> and that was the last time you saw him? Well, no, I saw him after that. You know, I, I saw him, you know, other restaurants uh, near the end, but he was like that at least the last couple of years, you know. And a nice guy. You know, all those guys, Sammy, Frank, Dean, they were really cool guys. You know, they were men's men. When they liked you, uh, you know, they behaved with that fun because they'd been given this incredible life and even after they all passed and everyone was so sad I said look on a happy side these guys have lived the life of three guys mm, yeah. they lived like they were 250 years old <laughs> but they lived mm. and they were honest about it and whatever they went into that wasn't normal to others it was what they wanted to do and they were great guys to be around all of them they were gentlemen they were really gentlemen. I can't really say as the, the kid growing up around it, and I benefited from it, that they did any bad stuff. They, they always got my vote, no matter what they did. Wow. They just weren't malicious guys. What was that? This is an amazing... I, I like taking photos of people I like, too. And, I, and I, your photo collection just shits all over mine. You get the Beatles and Elvis. And I <laughs> love the Jerry Lee Lewis from, in 1958 going <laughs> yeah. to, I think, Australia. Australia on a plane. You don't see many guys with a photo yeah. with Jerry Lee Lewis. What kind of, what kind of guy was he? He was wild. <laughs> Jesus, he didn't like me. I don't like him. Oh, really? Oh, really? Well, we, we, we had an off and on thing, right? Because uh -huh. I was this young kid having hits, and he was older, and he was pissed. <laughs> and, you know, he liked to drink, but he just didn't like me, and I didn't like him. So we went at it a lot. We had a fight at 35,000 feet over the Pacific, and then we'd roll back to take a picture, and then he'd get after me. But it wasn't a... And I went down with him and Buddy Holly, so he and I were off and on, Jerry. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, you I, knew I, Buddy I, as well? Oh, Buddy was my dear, dear close friend. Oh, really? Yeah, Buddy Holly. He and I were opening wow. a company together, a music company, because he wanted to change, and that's why I wrote the song for him. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, he had called me with my manager and uh, and said, I'm, you know, I'm quitting with the group, getting rid of my managers, I need some money. And we arranged that tour for him where the plane went down. But he and I would always get together and just talk. He was, he was such an influential guy. You know, when I met the Beatles for the first time, they talked about Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, mm -hmm. Muddy Waters. These guys had influenced them. And Buddy was a, such a raw, talented guy. His music was just so clean. Mm -hmm. And we would talk about forming a business together after he got his affair straightened out and we were going to have a music company together and uh, when he called and you know I wrote the tune for him and I said let's go to New York we'll use a big band that was the first big band with strings and all that stuff that he liked that I was doing with You Are My Destiny and all that and we went in the studio here in New York and here was Buddy Holly coming off a three piece band mm. with a huge string section wow. and all this shit around him <laughs> and he does It Doesn't Matter Anymore wow. right and it starts to climb up the charts, and then a few months later, I get that phone call. Right. Just devastated. All wow. Us. Man, oh, man. Yeah, what a talent to do. The book is uh, it's called My Way by Paul Anka, and it's it's un I wish I'd read the whole thing. I just didn't have time to, but what I've read is the, every page I turned to just to get like little notes and discussion points was was packed with something that I wanted to read. And uh, you, you start off writing about Vegas, and it's just it's fantastic what I've read of this book. Thank you very much. I really, really I want to read that. the entire thing, and you have a fascinating life. I think it's going to do well. I think, yeah. I think it's going to do well. I mean, you can't, right. even if you don't like certain kinds of music, you can't not be interested in the lifestyle that, yeah. that, that yeah. these guys, and, and uh, I love the honesty in this. Well, you know, that was a big decision, how, how, how open I cut the veins here, and I realized that I'm not going to write a fluff book. I'm not going to get into... 
what Frank had for breakfast, or Frank Yavel and I had a cannoli contest in Wildwood. <laughs> Who cares? You know, you're, you're ultimately maybe stepping on some toes, and sure. I hope not. But I, I wanted to be very honest about what my experience was, and the message in there with all of that honesty of what I saw. You know, you have to remember, there's always a lot of hearsay, and there was a lot of hearsay about the mob and Frank and all that. But I was there, and and the message in all of that is. They, as in myself, were just human beings, you know, and and don't stand in judgment because I'm not a judgmental person. But however we carried on, or however they carried on, or the things that happened to me in my life, life that affected me, this is the honest facts. in In terms of where we're at today as a society, we're all crying out for honesty and what's true from the country to this. And I see a lot of people that come out there and just bullshit and write fluff and, you know, come in and you guys have to suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> and I figured, you know what? They're not going to take any signs down in Hoboken about Frank. He's going to go down as the one of their greatest sons and he gave to charity in the billions and he was a great guy and a great artist. And everything I say in there is about love for him, Sammy. Every, everyone that I write in there, but it had to be the truth for me, or why do it? Mm -hmm. and, and and if you don't do it, you got a book this thin, and you got your one shot of writing a book. And at my age, I figured, you know, if a couple of people get pissed because they really don't understand it, that's their fault. Right. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not going to sit and tell lies and leave stuff out and have people go, well, give me away, we heard. You know, because <laughs> I'm accessible. But a lot of guys that write these books about these people or those times, they're on the periphery. They've never left their little hometown and they're gathering material. <laughs> right. I was there. Right. I was on the 50-yard line. I was in the locker room. I saw it. I smelt it. I did it. <laughs> so I'm going to tell. Right? And you're able to write it. You're a really good writer. <laughs> well, what a great interview, man. Yeah, we this appreciate it. Oh, our show, our oh, show is over. I love, love your show. I'm... Uh, Listen to your show. Thanks, Paul. Thank I appreciate it's a great it. Great Paul Anka. It's called My Way. And also, uh, the CD uh, is called uh, Paul Anka Duets, and it's yep. the same cover on both. It almost looks like they're purposely Annie Leibovitz, out. i got to tell you, she did a great job. Oh, it's Annie Leibovitz. Annie Leibovitz, Annie Leibovitz cover. Leibovitz, huh? right. She's so talented, and what a lovely yeah. woman. I loved working with her. Wow. And her contribution was just great, and her, her, her uh, photo in the Vanity Fair piece. She's just a very talented human being. I have to thank her. And everybody at St. Martin's and Sony, they've been an incredible team. You know, I've always said that uh, success has many fathers. i got a lot of good people around me that really have brought this to fruition for me. Right. Well, awesome. you, you certainly did it right. And uh, I'll say for the record in closing that Paul is probably the best smelling guy we've had I, here I, in a long <laughs> time. It's, it's unbelievably good stuff. Whatever. I wanted to ask you when you came in, but I figured that might just have a weird tone. with my girlfriend because we were like hanging out real heavy till this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess we will see everyone tomorrow. Absolutely. The great Paul Anka. Thank you, Paul. Hey, thank Thanks, you, man. Bob. I'll keep listening. Love it and hope he feels better if he's listening. Right thank on. You. Yeah. Glad you weren't here today. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>